Hey everyone, let's make a StarCraft 2 map. In our last episode, we worked on the modular weapon system. We created a couple new weapons and we fired them from the mech. Now we have to combine them together to finish the modular weapon system. We want this to function similar to how it is in the Mech Warrior series, but we also need to make sure that this is something that the players can enjoy using. Theoretically, the modular weapon system is going to be really awesome to use, but we need to test that theory. And this brings us to this video's topic, prototyping. First of all, what is a prototype? Basically, it's an early sample or a model that's used to test a theory or a concept. This is used in all areas of research and development, created to test one specific thing. For our purposes, we're testing a game mechanic. In this case, it's the modular weapon system. This is important to us because we need to make sure that not only the functionality can be implemented, but we need to make sure it's fun for everyone. The best example I can use to illustrate this is 3-Wave Capture the Flag for Quake. During the mod's development, the original design called for the entire game to be reset when a capture occurred. The players and their flags respawn in their respective bases, and they start fresh for another round, collecting all the weapons and the items again. Theoretically, this would be ideal, but before a full implementation of the game mechanic was done, a prototype was created. A single map, two flags on the opposite sides, and they jumped into the game. Turned out, resetting everyone was tedious and boring. It killed the flow of the game. The functionality was scrapped, and instead, only the flags were reset. The pace of the gameplay was much faster, and the gameplay was much more enjoyable as a result. The point is, they never invested a lot of time designing the function to reset everyone. They made a working prototype and tested it to see if this was what they really wanted. If it is, they move on to extending the feature, debugging it, polishing it, and integrating it into the core of the gameplay. But it's not, so they scrapped it, and a minimal amount of time and effort was lost. There's no point in continuing work on a feature that's going to be removed anyway. Big budget studios do this all the time because, after all, time is money. They have the ability to scrap entire game engines if it's necessary, even cancelling games in extreme cases. For Deep Blue, you may have noticed me doing this every time I implement a new feature. It's not a full test of the gameplay, but I step into the game to test that specific feature. I did this with the movement, the attacking, the accuracy, recoil, all that good stuff. I check to make sure of things. Does it feel right? Do I enjoy doing this? If it's yes, then it stays. If it's no, I remove it. At the moment, we still have to finish the modular weapon system. I have three weapons I can use, and I enjoy using them. And because I enjoy using them, more likely than not, other people will enjoy using them too. So now, we can extend the functionality. Everything we need to do in the data editor is done already. So now, we move on to the trigger editor. We need to change the code in some of our triggers, and we're adding some new triggers as well. First, we go to Use Current Weapon. This is the trigger that runs when we left-click on the map. Originally, this handled the firing code. It checks if you have enough ammo, checks if you want to continue firing, and it contained all the related calculations, accuracy, recoil, etc. Now, all this trigger does is runs a function called Fire Weapon Group. All the functionality from this trigger has been moved to two functions, the Fire Weapon Group function and the Fire Weapon function. We also modified the code a bit, and I'll show you this later. The reason we moved this is because another trigger will run this code as well. This makes things easier to modify later on. Next, we have a new trigger called Repeat Weapon Fire. This runs on a countdown timer, and in this case, it's the weapon cooldown. When the timer reaches zero, this trigger will run. All it does is check to see if the left mouse button is still being held down. If it is, it runs the fire weapon group function. Basically, you fire again. If not, you stop firing. Again, this function appears in two places, so if I need to change something in the firing mechanic, I just have to do this in one place, and if there's a bug in the code, this makes it easier to fix it. Now, we'll look inside the fire weapon group function. 
It should be fairly obvious what this does. It fires all the weapons in a group. It loops through all the weapons in the group, and it calls the fire weapon function for each individual weapon. It's pretty straightforward. As for the fire weapon function, this checks if the weapon can fire. It checks the ammo, cooldown, is it damaged? If it's good to go, it fires. Same stuff, but we've changed the code a bit. When the weapon fires, it starts the cooldown timer, and this timer is attached to the repeat weapon fire trigger I've discussed earlier. The cooldown depends on the weapon. Lasers are 5 seconds, machine guns are just a few milliseconds. These triggers will fire the weapons perfectly fine, but we're only halfway done. We still need the weapons to automatically switch when we stop firing. We already have a trigger for that which is called, well, stop firing. The weapon group that's fired is determined by a variable called select weapon index. Every player has this variable, so every time a player releases the left mouse button, the selected weapon index will be set to the result of a function called auto next weapon group. This function loops through the player's weapon groups to see if there's a weapon that's ready to fire, and this is checked in order, just like in the Mech Warrior games, so the next available weapon group is selected. If there are no available weapons to fire, nothing changes. And that's it! The functionality is done. We also implemented a simple HUD for the weapons, so we can see all the variables in real time. I won't talk about this for now since this is part of the user interface, that's for another episode. For now, we have a working prototype. Let's play with it. As you can see, the weapons automatically switch as intended. It doesn't switch to an inactive weapon, that is, a weapon that's in cooldown, damaged, or out of ammo. The machine guns continue to fire until I release the left mouse button. The Viper missile launchers requires two ammo per shot, while the machine guns only use one per shot. If you remember from the last episode, this weapon fires two missiles per volley. Because our mech has two missile launchers, we're actually firing four missiles in total. It's just hard to see. The heads-up display on the left side is just a temporary one to help test and illustrate the functionality. It's part of the user interface, and it's blocking a good portion of the screen. This will be changed to a more robust implementation when we focus on the UI in a later episode. But for the time being, the modular weapon system for a mech is now complete. It looks and feels very simplistic when you're actually playing it, but I'm sure by now you're aware of just how complicated it can get behind the scenes. This is just a mod for an existing game. Just imagine what working on a game from scratch would be like. I hope this series will give you an idea of that. Of course, we could just sit here and create all the weapons for the game and have fun with them. But we have to move on. In the next episode of Deep Blue, it's a new game mechanic. When you die, something has to happen, and we need to make sure it's handled gracefully. Look forward to it.